The next topic we want to look at is um, Riemann sums. Now this is probably, for a lot of students, this is maybe the most technically challenging section um, in the entire course for Calculus 1. Um, conceptually, I think, if you pause and you think about it for a second, conceptually it's not so bad. Um, but technically it's difficult because it's very, it's notationally heavy. We're going to introduce some sort of new ideas that you've maybe not dealt with in the past, like indexing and summation notation. And, um, you know, so it's very easy to get kind of caught up in the details and bogged down and, and forget what you're actually trying to do. And what we're actually trying to do is calculate an area, okay? So we have some graph here, say y equals f of x, okay? We want to find the area under the curve um, you know, from sort of beginning to end. Now, this particular one is, say, from zero, zero to four, as it turns out. Um, and, well, what we've seen already is that we have a name for this area. We say, well, this is the integral. It's the integral from zero to four of f of x dx. All right? We define this definite integral as signed area under a curve. Okay, great. Um, how do we calculate it? This is, this is kind of the, the key question, right? Um, what sort of areas do we know how to calculate? We know how to do like rectangles and triangles and circles. And if you really paid attention in high school geometry, maybe you know a few more. Middle school geometry? Anyway, um, you probably don't know that many area formulas. In particular, for an arbitrary you know, function, um, continue, let's say continuous function, uh, make sure the area is defined. What can you do? Um, this one here, by the way, this is supposed to represent the graph uh, 4x uh, minus x squared. It's the example that's done in the book. Um, how do you find this area? Well, the idea is we can't find it exactly, but maybe we can find it approximately, right? And the whole kind of theme, the whole story with Riemann sums is that you're just doing approximation by rectangles, right? Everything we're doing, however complicated it ends up looking, all we're doing is approximating by rectangles. Why rectangles? Because we know how to find the area of a rectangle, right? It's, it's sort of the, it's the simplest shape that we know. Okay, now, um, let's see. So that point there, when x is equal to 2, um, right, this is the sort of peak. That's at uh, 2, 4. And, and so, OK, here's a bad approximation. We can just draw in this sort of enclosing rectangle, right? And we could use that rectangle to say, OK, well, the area is approximately, well, it's 4 by 4, right? 4 times 4. Um, 16. Well, that's obviously not the area. It's a, it's, it's a significant overestimate because the rectangle is including all of this stuff here and all of this stuff here, which we don't want to be including in our area. So we say, well, okay, this is, uh, this is a bad estimate, right? So how can you improve that estimate? Well, what we do is we, we take more rectangles. We sort of, we start subdividing. And so we say, well, okay, let's take that, you know, this interval from zero to four, and maybe we'll break things up at the integer points. One, two, three, four. Um, and at each of these points, we'll draw ourselves a rectangle. And what we'll do is, you know, let's actually plug those points in. So, when x is equal to 1, let's see, y is equal to, well, we can plug it in, it's 3, right? So 1, 3. When x is equal to 2, we did that one already, y is 4. When x is equal to 3, uh, y is equal to 3 again. Okay. And so then what we can do is we can now, instead of just taking sort of one rectangle, we kind of took the, the max, um, we can do this. We can take 
this rectangle and then that rectangle and maybe we'll just kind of use the the right endpoint here for each of these intervals to define a rectangle for us right um, now for the last one that's not so interesting the the rectangles just sitting right down there at the bottom um, okay but maybe this is a, a little bit better of an estimate I mean we kind of look at this and we say, okay, well, we get, we get all this extra here, and we get this extra here. Um, oh, but then we cut out some here, and we cut out some there, and, and maybe these, these kind of changes are going to sort of balance out. And so now we can say, well, the area is approximately, well, each of these rectangles now has sort of width 1, and so the first one is 1 by 3, so 3, uh, and then 1 by 4, so 3 plus 4, and then 1 by 3, so 3 plus 4 plus 3. Uh, oh, this time we get 10. And, and maybe that's a little bit better. And you can think about other ways that you can improve this. What are some other ways you can improve the approximation? Um, well, one way, and this is something in, in the section on numerical integration, which comes up later on, um, we discussed that one way you can actually improve this is don't take the right endpoint for each of these intervals that you're using to create the rectangles. What you should actually do is take the sort of the midpoint for each one. Um, so you take the middle of each interval, right? And then you know you get you know a little bit extra here, but you cut out a corresponding amount there, right? Uh, this part is you know extra area that we don't want, but then we leave out some area here, right? We, we miss some and we include some. And, and so you kind of, you could do it that way as well. And, you know, we could, and we could figure out what those values are. In fact, it's not too hard because we know what these, we know what these 1.5, uh, 0 0.5, 1.5, 2.5, 3.5, .5, and we could plug those in, I'm not going to do the calculation just now, but we could plug those numbers into the function. We could get those new heights, calculate new rectangles with different heights, and hopefully get a slightly better estimate than this one, right? Um, or maybe, maybe we use these points here to kind of take our four rectangles and divide them again and get, let's say, eight rectangles um, and, and see if we can improve the height that way. And so one of this, there, there are various strategies that you can use. And the strategy that you use is really going to depend on the scenario that you're dealing with. Right? Um, if you're actually doing numerical integration, which is something that a lot of people have to use, um, especially in sort of like scientific scenarios where the, you don't actually know your function precisely. What you have is some data, and you know that you want to model that data by a function, and you don't know what the function is, but you have some data points that you can plot. Um, right? And you have a certain number of those, and, and then you might say, well, okay, well, the number of data points that you have, that's kind of, that's telling you how many rectangles maybe you're going to use. Right? Um, or, or maybe you're limited by computational resources, not so much these days, but in the past, it was an issue, and so um, you know, if you take too many rectangles, your calculation is going to take forever, and that's a problem, right? Um, and so, if you're if you're limited in the number of rectangles, you, I only have this many rectangles to work with. Um, well, then you start thinking about for a given number of rectangles, what are some ways I can improve my approximation? Maybe by taking the midpoint. Um, later on, you'll see another method is is called the trapezoid method, where you um, you basically join the left and the right endpoints on each interval. And you know that gives you a slightly better approximation. You can see that that actually looks okay, right? For four rectangles looks okay. Um, and sure. So that that works as well. You can do those sorts of things. But what if we're just imagining that we are in a situation where we have no limit on the number of rectangles that we can take, right? We're, we're doing calculus and we're just, you know, we're doing this on paper, we're doing it in our brains, we're not worried about actual practicalities of computation. Um, 
we're sort of playing around and thinking theoretically, right? Well, in our minds, there's maybe no limit to how many rectangles we can take, right? And if there's no limit to the number of rectangles that you can take, well, then you say, well, let's just consider some arbitrary number of rectangles, right? And so we'll draw a picture. Maybe it looks something like this, right? So this initial point, you know, um, we'll call that, say, x naught, our starting point, step zero, if you like, right? And, and then we're going to have an, an x1 and an x2 and an x3 and so on. Um, and we, we're dividing into, let's say, n rectangles. So at the end, you'll get to an xn, right? Um, so the first rectangle goes from 0 to 1, second rectangle from 1 to 2, third from 2 to 3, and so on, right? Um, so there's an x, let's say, n minus 1 there, just before you get to the end, right? So you divide into these rectangles, or, or if you like, you get, um, you know, so far we're just looking at these intervals, right? And they're going to look like this. They're going to look like xi minus 1 to xi, with i going from 1 up to n. Right? Um, OK, so we have these intervals. So now the next thing we do is we, in each interval, we're going to choose a point. And we could do like we did here. We choose right end points, or, or we could choose left end points, or maybe we want to choose midpoints, um, or, or something else. Right? So we choose a point in each one of our intervals, something like that. Okay, So we choose n points. Let's call them maybe ci. And that point ci is going to be in that corresponding interval. Okay, And so then we can calculate. n heights f of a ci, right? So all we're going to do is, you know, we take each of these points, we plug them into our function. So that really just means going up to the graph, right? I'm not going to draw all of them. That's a bit tedious. But we kind of go up. We get the we get the y values by plugging into the function, right? And and so that means we get n rectangles, and each one is going to have some area, right? A i, and it's going to be sort of f of ci, that's going to be the height. What's the width? Well, the width is just the length of the little interval, right? Um, we'll call that maybe delta xi. And that delta x is just xi, right? Right endpoint minus left endpoint to get the width of an interval, right? So we get these rectangles. Draw a few of them in. Again, not all of them necessarily. Right? And we get something that looks like this. Uh, well, you know, let's, let's try to draw a couple more. Like so, okay. I think I'll stop there. And so you know, you can sort of see that as we as we add more points, right? As we add more rectangles, and the rectangles get skinnier, the approximation gets better, right? Um, thinking about these rectangles here covering my shape, 
compared to when we just had like these four rectangles covering my shape, um, we're doing a lot better, right? Yes, there's, you know, there's a little bit extra and a little bit that's missed, but you know, it's a lot smaller than it was before. And the skinnier the rectangles get, the smaller those bits are going to get, right? Um, and so what we get now is we get sort of a, a better approximation for this area. We, so well, this area is, is approximately, and it's going to be, we use summation notation for this, right? So it's, it's A1 plus A2 all the way up to AN, right? Um, but we get tired of writing out the sums long form like this, so we say, well, this is the sum. I going from 1 to N of AI. Right? And yes, we will talk about, so if you haven't seen summation notation before, don't worry, because we will spend time talking about it. Right? And, and so what we get is something that looks like this, F of CI times delta XI. Right? Um, and so the, the punchline here is, well, if this approximation keeps getting better and better and better as you increase the number of rectangles, um, then you might ask, well, what happens as n goes to infinity? If you let the number of rectangles go to infinity, what's going to go on there, right? And it seems like a weird thing. How do we add up the area of infinitely many rectangles? Isn't that going to be infinite? Well, not exactly, because the area of each rectangle is going to zero, right? So you're adding up infinitely many things that are infinitely tiny. Um, and you're doing this in a way that it always kind of comes, the sum comes out to a finite number, right? Um, so what you do is you kind of, you calculate the sum as a function of n, if possible, and then you can ask what happens when n goes to infinity. And, well, what happens when n goes to infinity is you get the integral, right? The idea is that you start with the approximation, and then you discover that approximation in the limit becomes exact, right? And so this is another way of defining the integral, defining the integral as this limit of a Riemann sum, right? And it's going to be, it's going to get a little messy, it's a little complicated, but we push through and once we make it through to the end, we will meet the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is going to tell us that there are actually some much nicer ways of evaluating these integrals, in some cases, okay? Um, but we can't establish the fundamental theorem of calculus without using Riemann sums. This is a necessary tool to kind of get to that theorem and prove that theorem. We need this as a tool. Also, there are going to be situations where the fundamental theorem of calculus, which is going to be nice, you're going to see, it's going to be great, but it doesn't work 100% of the time. It doesn't work if you're dealing with numerical data. Uh, doesn't work if you're dealing with a function um, where you don't know how to find what's called an antiderivative. We, we've talked about antiderivatives already, right? Uh, it's going to turn out that you need those antiderivatives to use the fundamental theorem. It's not always possible to write down a formula for the antiderivative, okay? Um, so there is a need to actually do all the technical stuff, even if the technical stuff is, is not the most pleasant. Okay? But we'll go slowly, we'll work through some examples, and we'll see that it's, it's not so bad in the end.